I've been putting up a few graphs on Twitter about the performance of the UK economy over a hundred years and people suggested that I do a video on it. So I'm doing this one on the mixed economy in the UK and the period before it and after it. I'm going to look at three periods, that of classical liberalism, the mixed economy and the neoliberal economy which followed it. And within the video I'm going to use a lot of economic statistics and these are drawn from earlier publications which came out largely in the 70s or, or so. Um, in particular I, I'm drawing on statistics I prepared for this 1977 paper for the Conference of Socialist Economists and this paper that Alan Cottrell, Greg Michelson and myself wrote for the journal of the Conference of Socialist Economists. So let's look at the, the period of classical liberalism and you can divide this itself into three phases, the, the late 18th and early 19th century, the late 19th century up to 1914, and the period 1914, I should say 1914 to 1939. The late 18th, early 19th century was a period during which machinery was being applied to the production of consumer goods but not yet to the production of means of production. This meant that the organic composition of capital tended to rise in parallel with the technical composition of capital due to the slower rate of growth of productivity in department one, that is to say, the department which produces means of production. And this rise in the organic composition of capital was offset by the increased production of relative surplus value due to the rapid rise in productivity in consumer goods in the textile industry, coal, food and drink manufacturing industries. This is the period that's described in Marx's Capital which was written in the 1860s. So I'm not going to go into it in more detail. The period from 1860 to 1900 showed a different characteristic. Machinery was being applied to both departments, by two and, and one, but the latent reserve army of labor, that is to say the population in the countryside had not yet been exhausted. If you get accelerated productivity in Department 1, this cheapens the elements of constant capital and allows a growing physical output with very little net capital accumulation in terms of money. This allowed the upper classes to spend an increasing proportion of the surplus on servants, country houses and luxury goods and they take on the characteristic of a rentier class. During this period, the organic composition of capital can fall and the rate of profit can rise. That's what we'll see. So this is the, the period 1860 to 1900. The blue line shows the organic composition of capital. You can see it slowly falling. The rate of surplus value rises and then levels off, rises whilst the still relatively rapid migration from the countryside to the towns levels off when that becomes harder to, to sustain. And the rate of profit rises because the, the falling organic composition of capital offsets the relatively stagnant um, organic sorry, relatively stagnant rate of profit, rate of surplus value. So the rate of profit is oscillating with the business cycle as the during the business cycle, unemployment rises and falls, wage rates rise and fall, and this gives an oscillation in the rate of profit.
and there's a lagged oscillation in the level of investment um, but the overall trend is downwards overall trend of the organic composition of capital in the late 19th century was downwards and this meant that there was a low absolute rate of accumulation this is the share of profits that were accumulated over that period now it's oscillating with the business cycle but the striking thing about it is that it the overall figures are so low look at the scale here 10 percent the peak in the late 1870s 10 percent uh, accumulation out of profits it in just after 1900 it goes up to just over 16 percent but over most of the time 90 percent of profit was being consumed and on on luxuries rather than on reinvestment so that in the late 19th century what Marx said about uh, capitalists accumulate 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 shall be your Moses and your profits that was no longer their motive their motivation was live in the lap, lap of luxury and don't bother accumulating that's how they spent their profits big houses lavish interior design horrible taste smart luxury trains to travel in however over the period the urban population was growing Marx says accumulation of capital is growth of the proletariat and the proletariat grew growth of the proletariat tended to hold wages down but by the end of the 19th century it levels off now this graph is drawn from figures at 50 year intervals so that it's it's relatively smooth but during the the period from 1800 to 1900 about five percent of the population per decade was shifting from the countryside to the town in the 20th century it dropped to about one percent of population per decade moving to the town and this meant but by the end of the 19th century or the beginning of the 20th the latent reserve army had been used up the effect of the exhaustion of the latent reserve army was that it became possible to organize general unions instead of just craft unions in the mid 19th century the working class was able to organize craft unions because these had limited entry because you take took time to learn a craft skill it was very hard to unionize unskilled work because there were too many migrants into the towns who would undermine any union organization at that point from the late 19th century general workers union started to be formed there was a huge wave of strikes in the first decade of the 20th century this is a, a photograph from a strike in 1912 and you got a realignment of politics on the grounds of the opposition between the working class and the capitalist class this hadn't occurred in the 19th century so long as there was a mass inflow of new workers it was not possible to organize politics on class lines but with the start of the 20th century you got the formation of the Labour Party and the eclipse of the Liberal Party so that you got a crisis of the old liberal order you can see this in a graph here showing the number of seats held at successive 20th century elections between 1915 and 1950 and the trend line shows that the Labour Party rises the Liberal Party goes down to extinction so that from being a situation where political polarization was between the Tory party and the Liberal Party with the Liberal Party being able to pick up such working-class votes as there were because 
for most of the 19th century, unskilled workers didn't have the vote, you shifted to a situation where pol political polarisation was on class lines between a working class party and one single party which came to dominate all the upper class votes, all the property class votes, which was the Tory party. Now, if we look at the, the period of the last stage of liberalism after the, second, after the First World War, and look at the rate of accumulation then. I said that the rate of accumulation was low in the late Victorian period. Generally only about 10% of profit was being accumulated. If you look at the average share of profits being accumulated between the two wars, the average was zero. On average there was zero net accumulation. It never even reached 10% of profits being accumulated. So the, the liberal order was in major crisis at this point. It was no longer able to develop industry. And this is the period during which you get people like Trotsky saying that the capitalist system is in terminal crisis, it's unable to develop the forces of production. Because that appeared to be the case. And this meant that the organic composition of capital fell. Now the organic composition of capital fluctuates from year to year as it is the ratio of total wages to capital stock and as employment fluctuates and as wage rates fluctuates it can alter independently of the technical composition of capital. But if you take a long run trend do a linear regression over the, the two decades, you see that the downward trend is very clear. The trend tendency over time was for the organic composition of capital to fall, as it had been in the late 19th century. And this is a characteristic of liberal orders in a developed capitalist or, or fully capitalist economy. They accumulate very little. And in the 1920s and 30s, they actually de disaccumulated. However, a fall in the organic composition of capital can produce a rise in the rate of profit. The top line shows the trend of the rate of profit between the wars tending to rise, and the mass unemployment created during the interwar period allowed the rate of exploitation to rise. So this bottom graph shows the trend of the rate of exploitation. Both of those are rising. So from the point of view of the property classes, they were comfortable. So the two things together, mass unemployment, low wages and raising exploitation along with the declining organic composition of capital al allowed the profit rate to rise. The destruction of capital was quite deliberate. Uh, I live in the Glasgow area and just along from me is Dalmuir and Dalmuir had one of the largest and most modern shipyards on the Clyde uh, where Beardsmores were, who were a great engineering company which not only produced um, ships but in the early 20s also produced airships, all sorts of things. Uh, but this most modern yard on the Clyde was bought up by its competitors and dismantled in order to reduce competition. The actual decline in the organic composition of capital was in large part the deliberate destruction of productive capacity by competing firms. That came to an end in 1939. From 1939 to 1945 uh, a state capitalist war economy existed and this was state capitalist in the sense that Lenin and Mao Zedong used the term where they refer to a system where the economy is in private ownership but there are strict controls on capital movement, there's rationing, there's planning of physical output to meet war needs, and very high levels of taxation on high earners. Um, by the end of the war, 
the top rate of income tax was 19 shillings and sixpence in the pound, which is in modern terms a 97.5% rate of tax on top incomes. Essentially, top incomes were being confiscated. At the same time, there was labour power planning. There was direction of labour into particular industries. If you look at the first column here, it shows the, the number of thousands of workers in the different industry categories shown on the right in 1938. And this is shows after four years of planning what the industry categorizations of the workforce had become. Now, obviously, there's a huge increase in number of people in the armed forces, which is this red line here. But there's also a huge increase in the number of people in metals, engineering, vehicles and shipbuilding, key productive industries. There is also an increase in this purple one, which is national and local government because of increasing state direction of activities. And the... There's also an increase here in chemical industries producing munitions. Lots of service industries decline. Deliberate rundown of service activities because they're non-essential. You then had a post-war mixed economy uh, from 45 roughly to 75, I would say, uh, during which period major sectors of the economy were taken into state ownership you had controls on capital and currency movements which had been introduced during the war were retained. The Bank of England was nationalised and strict controls were imposed on consumer credit. Um, the lending ratios that the banks and building societies were allowed to maintain were under Bank of England control to control consumer credit. There was a big expansion of free education and free health care and state investment levels were kept high in order to ensure empl uh, full employment. They were able to do this because the, the state owned a substantial part of the capital stock. For instance, in 1960, the, about 37% of productive capital was state owned. And the economy combined what you could call an actual communist sector, the National Health Service, a socialist sector, the, the nationalised industries, plus state-directed capitalist sectors. For example, the production of power plants and the production of aircraft, although carried out by private firms, was largely carried out on government contracts. The government was the sole purchaser of power plants. And because the aircraft, in, sorry, the airline industry was nationalised, the government was the primary purchaser of aircraft. Similarly with road construction. The, the, road, uh, the, the civil engineering companies were basically dependent on government orders. But there was a private capitalist sector producing consumer goods both domestically and for export. It's in many ways similar to post-Deng China. The, the model that Britain had from 1945 to 75 is like modern China, except if anything, Britain had a somewhat larger communist sector. But the important thing about this is that this period of mixed economy had a far higher economic performance than the liberal periods which came before it and after it. And I'm going to look at the um, overall performance before looking at the overall contradictions which were inherent in this semi-socialist form of economy. First point is to say yes its performance was good. During the period of the mixed economy the labour productivity in the economy grew by about three and a half percent a year. In the period from 1850 up to then it had grown on average 1.25 percent and in the period since then, it's grown at just under 2%. So it grew at almost twice the rate in the mixed economy period 
that it has after that. And almost three times the rate that it had grew, grown earlier. This is worth emphasising because it's presented that the performance of the pre-Thatcherite economy was poor. In fact, it was very good. It was able to do that because there was a rapid rate of accumulation. Most profit in this period went on investment run luxury consumption. And this led to good improvements in labour productivity. If you look at this graph, um, it rose rapidly, capital accumulation. And from the mid 50s onwards, it, or late 50s onwards, more than half of profits were being accumulated. And a high accumulation rate also meant low levels of unemployment. It is the rate of reinvestment of surplus value that tends to de determine the level of um, employment. And you can see this by looking at long-term figures for unemployment. This is Bank of England data going back to the 1850s. And you can see in the liberal period, let's take what I've done is I've looked at the late Victorian period and taken the average rate of unemployment during that period. And if you then look at the, the semi-socialist period, almost all of it was below the late Victorian period. Because this is a, a five year moving average, it, it trends up a bit little, little earlier than the actual figures went up. Whereas during the neoliberal period, it was consistently above. The interwar crisis period and the neoliberal period were worse than average, whereas the semi-planned semi economy was better than average. Some things only become apparent when you look at them over a long historical time scale. The consequence of this was that the working class politically and economically was much stronger during the semi-socialist period and was able to win a higher share of the value it created. This is the wage share of national income. And you can see during the period of old liberalism from 1920 to 1940 or 1939, there was a declining tendency of the wage share. I'd already shown that in the inverse in showing the rate of surplus value tended to rise. If you look at the planning regulation period, you see that there is a long term tendency of the wage share to rise. That's because of the low unemployment. If you look at the period after that, there is a long-term tendency of the wage share to fall. The high unemployment of the period since after we joined the European Union have weakened the negotiation position of labour and driven down wages. And uh, that's if you look at actual real wages, rather than the share of national income as real wages, you can see that the from the late 19th century to the Second World War, living standards for workers scarcely improved at all. If we take um, uh, 1900 as 100 here, we can see that there's scarcely any improvement between 1900 and, and 1934. On the other hand, in the post-war period, when accumulation as a share of wages shot up, real wages are able to follow. So high rates of capital accumulation enable real wages to rise. They enable this through two causal mechanisms. They enable it to rise because they increase productivity and they do it because they increase the bargaining position of labour. If we now look at the post-mixed economy period, the neoliberal 
period, we see that real wages are stagnant or falling again, as they had been in the period 1900 to 1939. That is characteristic of liberal capitalism. Stagnant or falling real wages. It also is reflected in the slower rate of growth of the capital stock of the country. During the mixed economy period, the capital stock in the form of productive assets rose by about 4.3% a year. After that, it grew at 3.2% a year, which is a shift to a model of economic growth, which was based on expansion of the labour supply, importing labour from other countries and very low rate of accumulation, only enough to re-employ new people rather than intensifying the amount of capital employed by each worker. Now, if you look at what this implies for the breakdown of different sectors in the economy. During liberal periods, you tend to see a decline in the productive economy relative to financial services, business services, rent and real estate. So this is the productive economy. This is the, the this is sorry, this is the share of value going made up by the productive economy. This is the share of value in national accounts apparently made up by financial services, business services, rent and real estate. Now we know that in real terms, that is all unproductive activity. These unproductive activities are appropriating a higher share of the national product and the share of the national product produced by and appropriated by the productive sector falls. During the period of relative economic planning, you got a, a big rise in the productive sector. The number of productive workers in Britain peaked around 1960 and then started to, call, to fall. So you see in the latter part of the um, the plan period from the 60s to the 70s, you started to get a rise in financial services, business services and rent. The Labour government of Harold Wilson attempted to offset this because at that stage, Labour politicians knew enough political economy to know that these sectors were unproductive. And they introduced what was known as the selective employment tax, which was designed to slow the growth of the unproductive sector. Employers in unproductive sectors like banking had to pay the government a tax for every worker they employed. So this did tend to slow down the growth of the unproductive sector. But it really took off after the Tories came in and introduced the Thatcherite model. And the productive sector fell rapidly. And notice this is production and construction and includes house building. Now, rent, business services, financial services and real estate rose as a share of the economy. But it didn't mean that people were actually getting more houses as rent and real estate services rose. The privatisation of the housing sector did not result in more square metres of housing being available. On the contrary, it actually resulted in the collapse in house building. This is the number of houses completed a year. After the Thatcherite policies are introduced, housing completions fall drastically. They fall to about half the level they were during the mixed economy period. Now, during the mixed economy period, a large number of houses were being built by the state and 
were being rented out on a non-profit basis. This tended to slow the rate of growth of private landlords' incomes. When these were privatised, the rate of growth of private landlords' incomes rose because there was no competition from council houses and at the same time the actual level of completions of houses fell which led to rapid rises in house prices which was fed through to the profits of the banks who were paying the mortgages on, on repurchased houses rather than paying for new houses to be built and the restricted supply of new houses meant that rent as a share of people's income rose substantially. And this is reflected in the rise in financial services and rent as a share of national income that I showed in the previous graph. So if the mixed economy was so good compared to what happened before or after, why was it replaced? How is it the press was able to retrospectively label the semi-socialist economy as a disaster. There were a set of class contradictions that broke the system, basically. Although rapid accumulation leads to economic progress, it also leads to a higher organic composition of capital, and that leads to a low rate of profit. That is a specific contradiction brought about by the private ownership of production. Full employment also leads to a rise in the wage share, which depresses profits. And there was also a tendency for a secular rise in rent as a share of surplus value, which tends to depress profit rates. Why was there that? It's basically because business rates in city centres tended to rise. Those were still in the private sector and private profits were being made on, on property speculation and business rates in the centres of cities were rising. Um, partly this because the state hadn't really introduced full site value rating, which it should have done. There was also a rise in both the private and public unproductive sector. The greater part of it was in the private unproductive sector. As a result, the residual private sector of the economy went into a, an investment slump because the rate of profit had fallen. So there was an investment slump in the private sector in the late 1970s. There were two possible ways out of this. Either you could move towards a fully socialist economy in which the state took over responsibility for funding investment, perhaps doing it out of general taxation. This was what was termed the alternative economic strategy being promoted by the Communist Party and the Labour left around Ben. Alternatively, you could restore the old liberal doctrines and this was what was known as the Selston Man strategy. Um, from the Selston report within of the right of the Tory party. In the end, what happened was going to be determined by politics. The problem was that the proponents of the alternative economic strategy were a minority within the Labour Party. But the Selston group, which came to be led by Thatcher, came to dominance in the Tory party. This meant that you had a series of elections in the 1970s which focused on which way was the economy going. The first attempt to move the economy in the Selston direction by Heath when he won the election was turned back by the resistance of strikes, particularly the minor strike which led to the overthrow of the Heath government. The mid-1970s Labour government continued broadly along the old Attlee-Gateskill type policies of bringing 
slowly bringing a few more sectors into the state sector, steel and shipbuilding, um, aircraft, parts of the car industry. But when the Callaghan took over, the there was a loss of, of determination on the part of the Labour Party and the Callaghan Jenkins wing started to retreat whereas the Conservative Party eventually fell entirely to the Selston wing and in 1979 only one party had a manifesto which said this is a way out of the crisis. The Labour Party under Callaghan was muddle on as usual. The Tories said we have a crisis, we have a way to solve it, we have a way to solve it by reimposing sound money um, liberal economic policies. What this shows is that without political economy a party representing the working classes can not really carry out any kind of socialist political practice. In the 40s and 50s the Labour Party were convinced that planned economy was the way to go. And they were reasonably confident in what they were going to do and they took steps to measure this. But without an understanding of how to deal with the crisis at the economic level, the working class parties can't confront the economics of the property classes. The Attlee and Wilson generation had at least a social democratic economic theory. And substantial elements of Marxist ideas were also present in that. By the 1970s the Labour Party had failed to adapt and was split between those who wanted to advance and those who faced with the crisis of the mixed economy wanted to retreat. This shows that you can't do that unless you have a, an overall economic policy for restructuring the whole economy, you will fail in the political conflict that will occur during elections. Unless you have a, an overall economic policy which is informed by political economy, you will not only fail economically but you will fail politically.